No. But I'm on though, so. What's going on today? We back. Back at it. What's good? We back. We back. We back. What's happening? We here, fam. Blessings, blessings, blessings. I miss you guys. I miss you guys. I miss y'all. I miss y'all. I miss y'all. My people. Remnant in this peace. Ain't no question. <laughs> Remnant in this peace. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Make sure when you come in, you like. Make sure when you come in, you like. Hit that like button when you come in. Let's get cracking. I'm still not. I'm still not finished talking about this man stuff. This manhood. We got to go in some more. We got to go in some more. What's happening with it, Cal? We back here. Shout out to you, loved one. Scoundrel TV, shout out to you. Jay Lyons, what's up with it, fam? Are oh, we just working around here, conquering things and operating in our dominion around here? Ain't nobody stopping nothing. They can't, it's our time. CJ Johnson, what's up with it, fam? Hit that like and share button. Let's get people in here. Talking about manhood today. We need to keep brushing up on it. Cahill, good to see you back, family. Ken Fo, what's up, Woody? Ace, thank you for kicking off with that 10, family. Billy Battle, what's up? Hope y'all been operating in the information. That's why we do this, for this remnant. The same for everybody. Lenny Hayes, what's up? Haynes, what's up, Lenny Haynes? Kendrick Cunningham, what's up with it? Gregory Pittman, what's happening with it? J.C. Hall, what's up with it, family? <laughs> We're going to wait for a few more to get into the room, and we're going to get going. Jordan, what's up? Thank you, Ace. Fred Anderson, what's up with it? Only your remnant going to get it. Mookaville, that's right. <laughs> Universal, FO, thank you for that too. FOA, Universal, FOA. Yeah, Hampton. Yeah. It's for the remnant. It's for us. Mac P, okay. Yeah. Gonna wait just a little bit more, you guys. Cash Oni, what's up? Suave, what's happening? Jamal Valdez, what's up with it? Toronto in the house. Jordan Dunn, what's up? Next time you talk to Yahweh, can you ask him where my hairline has gone? <laughs> Dre, what's up? Noon 2K, what's up with it, family? Thank you, Vincent. My family's from Ohio. My dad's from Ohio. So you, you caught that right on. All right, that 707, what's up with it? That looked like that Vallejo out there, 707. <laughs> Tennessee in the house. Tony David, thank you for that 20, fam. V-Town, yes, sir. Memphis in the house. Kim Folk. Oh. 
My dad's from Portsmouth, on the bottom of Ohio, Portsmouth, uh, 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 Ohio. But you know, they ran through mostly with that Cleveland. Uh, 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 a lot of the original players in this game came up out of that Ohio. The Magnificent Seven, uh, Joe Langford, all them came up out of this Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> the Mr. Mel Taylor, yeah, I know, man. I'm going to dig up some stuff from my dad. I think I got some audio of him that I'm going to bless you guys with. Low code, because your first name is hard for me to pronounce. Break it down for me. Unpack that for me. Yeah. Now, remember, you guys, I told you I was working on that uh, audio book where Gorgeous Dre meets Andre Taylor. And I think it's going to be extremely powerful, you know. 818, oh, that's the valley. What's happening with it? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, and I would like to have it done in three months, you know, if time permits. But there's so much other stuff that I'm doing around here, and uh, we'll see. But uh, it's coming this year for sure, hopefully out by the summertime, you know, where gorgeous Dre meets Andre Taylor, both of them in their character, you know, and to have a real discussion on different topics as Gorgeous Dre would see it in his perspective from the game, then Andre Taylor would see it and them two having that conversation is going to be extremely powerful. It's going to take a lot out of me to do because I got to get into the character of Gorgeous Dre. Like I told you guys before, I got to go look, to, listen to some old music, look at some old flicks and just get into that character, you know, because I haven't been that cat for over 20 years, but I know who he is, you know. Jamal, thank you for that 20. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm working on that, that audio book, and it's about to be real, real powerful and real informative from a, a, uh, uh, the game perspective, you know, and then from this movement perspective and them two coming together and clashing. You know, on, 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 like I said, on many topics, it's going to be real, real powerful. So you got to be waiting for that. You've been trying, Ace, you've been trying to get, I've been so busy, Ace, man, but you just got to reach me through my email. You know, right now I'm having my website redone and uh, uh, the web guy is, you know, taking his time to do it. But you're going to have to reach me through my email. It's probably the best way. And uh, uh, so we can set something up. I've had... You know, there are people that have been wanting to do some coaching, life coaching and mentoring. And, uh, you know, I've had to put them back for a month or so because I've been so busy. But the email was Andre, A-N-D-R-E, L as in Larry. Matt P, thank you for that 50, baby. Thank you coming through. Taylor, Andre, L as in Larry, Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R at Yahoo. Andre, L, Taylor at Yahoo. So if you guys want to reach me, reach me through there for right now and to the website, to the uh, gorgeousdray.com, is uh, totally complete, okay? So um, hit that like button in here, fam. You know, we about to get busy. Still a man around here. Ain't nothing changed. Still a man. You know what I'm saying? No matter what happens, extended clips, thank you for that five. No matter what happens, what transpires, at the end of the day, I'm going to be able to say I'm still a man. You know, the moment you lose that, you lose everything. The moment you lose your ability to say you still a man, you lose everything. You can, you might say it, you might say that you still a, still a man, but if you haven't produced anything that shows the evidence that you still a man, then that's just a throwaway line. That's just a throwaway line. You know what I'm saying? Let me tell you a situation that I had. So we just gave this uh, big meeting on Wednesday, two days ago. And I called it not this time's first annual community, city, and law enforcement meeting. Now, to have started off from the game over 20 years ago and to have worked myself through the system with Black Genius to be able to create this movement and this change and influence the biggest people in the city and state, political folks, to come to our little grassroots movement organization is an accomplishment within itself, right? because there must be something there that they respect through our organizing that they would come before the community with a transparent conversation. This is important, right? So I need to tell you this because I'm still a man. I'm still a man from the streets. I'm still a man in politics. 
I'm still a man dealing with a woman. I'm still a man dealing with another male or a man. I'm still a man in every season. And I want to make sure you can say that you still a man. Because you got to guard the man. You know there's a video I did on guard the man. So we need to, we need to uh, rehearse that again. Bring that back forward again. You know what I'm saying? Because we got to stay on this manhood because that's the thing that God has given us to restore our culture. From the man first down to the women and children. But I got to reach you first, right? You got to be able to say you still a man. So everybody didn't agree with how I was moving uh, uh, in my movement. You know, Michael, thank you for that five dollars. Everybody didn't agree. Uh, as I've told some of you before, they had a lot of black organizations that moved differently than me because their way or their concept of moving is disrupting the system any way they can. That's not how I move. You know what I'm saying? Because I've seen that happen and you disrupt. But then what after that? You know, you create more enemies. I don't have to disrupt, even though I think we need that for a season. That's not the way I operate because I operate with black genius. We're talking to the remnant today because everybody might not get this, but this remnant, you need to hear what I'm saying because I'm going to go all the way around a complete circle so you can understand the importance of still being a man, right? So <clears throat> there are organizations that don't like because they think somehow that respectability politics somehow is the wrong way to go. As if... I'm dealing with the I'm dealing with these uh, system people, and and the respectability that I'm given is because of them. The respectability that I'm given is because of me. <laughs> it ain't got nothing to do with them. It's because of who I am and who I and how I show up as a man. It ain't got nothing to do with them. So uh, 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 I had to check somebody the other, the other day that's from another black organization because they came to my meeting and they did some real small stuff that I didn't appreciate, right? Because every meeting that I start, I explain this is a safe place here, right? If you want to have anything disrespectful to say, it won't be in this space that I've created, right? You got to bring, you want to be in this space, you got to bring black genius into this space. Nothing petty, nothing small, right? So these people are professionals that I bring our guests here. You can ask them the tough questions. But if you got to disrespect somebody, we're going to escort you up out of here. Now, a lot of people don't like how I operate, but I believe in discipline and order and our people first. Right. And this ain't got nothing to do with the system. This got something to do that about how we want to show up, because there's a tendency for us to feel that we're going to do to them what they doing to us. But that ain't leading. My objective is to do what they can't do, to show them what leadership looks like. Because I'm the first man and I have great expectations of my people and myself and how we operate and move. So if I'm being respectful, I'm being respectful because of who I am as a person and then giving that energy off. It ain't got nothing to do with nobody else. So anyway, uh, like I said, one of the organizations was there, and so while, while one of my guests was speaking, his name is uh, Dow Constantine, he's a real powerful man, he is the uh, county executive in uh, uh, the county of King County in Seattle, right? And so I brought a whole bunch of other powerful people, uh, the city attorney and a whole bunch of powerful people, right? To explain to the community their responsibilities as a community, to have a transparent conversation with the community so the community can ask real questions which is why I did that right to build so while a man was speaking it was maybe around 30 minutes left the guy gets up in the front of everybody and I have a panel up front and and begins to pass out something right in front of each speaker while the people is speaking like like I'm going to do this because he got some issue with Dow Constantine, but I'm going to do this to show, this is my opportunity to show uh, him since uh, we don't get no respect for him. So I'm going to take this opportunity to disrupt something. And I don't really care what Andre said about how he run his meetings, but this is what I'm going to do. So I called the dude and I said, look, man, uh, Black Emperor, thank you for that too. I said, you know how I operate, man. I said, so what you really did, because I'm still a man, right? 
I said, what you really did, because he explained to me that uh, there's a prior history between him and Dow Constantine, and they're fighting for uh, 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 something up here about the no, the no uh, youth jail up here, and they wanted to take the opportunity to get his attention because he'd been kind of dissing them or whatever. And I told him, okay, I understand that. But if you would have called me and trusted me, you might not have had to just go pass out a little thing and disrupt, you know, what we were doing. I would have created a space for you had you put up posters uh, uh, around our meeting space and created a space for you so you can have your conversation with Dow while he was there. Right? But you dismiss all the work that I've done for over three years to even get these people into the room so that they could have a transparent uh, a communication with the community in the first place. So you said, forget all the work that Andre has done. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't care what you think about it, nigga. Excuse my expression, but I told him that's how I feel uh, because of the way you moved. I said, if you would have trusted me in the process, I would have created a greater, way greater space for you to address that situation that you was having. Right? But he didn't do that. Thank you, bro, for that 20, Black Emperor Music. So I'm trying to tell the young fella, he might be 27 and a cool dude, right? I'm trying to tell him it's a principle thing, man. Because you guys operate with disruption and I support you. But just because I don't operate like you operate, don't try to denigrate me. I said, you don't know how I move. I've been moving like this since I've been in the streets conquering systems. You know what I'm saying? I'm not just guessing my way through this stuff. I conquered them with this game, this information in the streets. I'm using this same information in this political system and it's working just like it worked in the streets. I'm so far ahead of your mindset, you don't even have a, a point of reference of how I'm moving. All you can see is the outside. Right? I've been moving like this for years. And you guys think I'm doing it with smoke and mirror. I'm not doing it with smoke and mirror. I'm doing it with black genius. Do you hear what I'm saying? So I'm telling the youngster, look, man, don't ever do nothing like that again. But trust the process. Holler at me. Holler at me. So first he was kind of resistant and stuff to it. You know what I'm saying? Because I told him, I said, look, man. I said, man, if you did some stuff like that on the streets, boy, the consequence would be so severe. The consequence behind that behavior would be so severe, you know? So at first he was trying, well, I didn't do anything and, and excusing and all this until ultimately he kind of understood a little bit. I'm just, what, what, my point today is that I'm going to choose to be a man in season and out of season. I'm not going to wait for an opportunity to be petty. Because remember, I taught you guys, wait for op every opportunity to be great. And when you see the opportunity to be great, you take advantage of it. But some of you are seeing the, oppor uh, the opportunity to be petty. And you know what? You might laugh about what you've done because you think you've done something extraordinary, but it don't last. It don't last. Great moves last. Great moves last. Them little petty moves don't last. I told my nephew D, I said, look, man, sometimes God allows things to happen, and I've said this to you guys before. Sometimes God allows things to happen in your life just to see if it'll make you petty. Just to see if it'll make you petty. Somebody going through something right now. You have the opportunity to be petty. In your mind right now, you say, boy, I can really get them people back like this. You ain't doing nothing to them, this, them people. You taking stripes away from your manhood. Because you ain't choosing to lead. Because something in you don't value the man in you enough. Right? And because you don't value the man in you enough, you don't see no problem in doing something petty to discredit your manhood. Because you don't see the man in you and how valuable that is. You don't still want to be a man. At the end of the day, I'm talking to every one of you out there. You better be able to say, I'm still a man. Regardless of the consequences. That's the most important thing for us. Is that you're going to show up to still be a man. 
Listen, my dad used to tell me, son, and I'm coming to talk to him about something, and I'm excited about something that's happening. And my dad said, well, son, anybody can do good when everything is going good. Anybody can do good when everything is going good. But can you do bad good? Right? Can you show up in your life as a man then? You only showing up because it's convenient for you to show up. But when you are faced with the tough test, you become petty. That's not who we are, black men. That's not who we are. I need to remind you the essence of who you are. Because so much of this indoctrination have affected our character as the first man. We've got to be willing to lead when it's uncomfortable. When I was teaching my nephew, I used to say I'm not a man because it's convenient all the time. Many times it's very inconveniencing to be a man. But I be a man because it's the right thing to do. Not because it's easy. Right? So I'm just telling you, opportunities will come for both. To be big or to be small. And remember I told you my dad said the only way to keep from being small is to be big. I'm talking to everybody, but this ain't for everybody. This is only for the remnant. And I remind you guys every day so that you won't be discouraged when you go try to share some of the information that I'm sharing with you to somebody and they don't get it. You must be reminded this is only for the remnant. The scripture said two-thirds will be killed off. He's talking about us, our people. Two-thirds will be killed off. And I've said this before because some of us is so in bondage to the indoctrination and socialization. Billy, thank you for that 20 of this culture that you never going to get out of it. You're going to stay in the matrix forever. So when I'm coming here and I'm speaking to you with this truth to keep you free and to keep reminding you who you are, and then you take this information and do the opposite of what we're trying to give you, then you're going to be one of those two-thirds that ain't going to make it. I'm not here to help everybody. I'm here to help the remnant. There's nothing more precious to me than the remnant out there. And I say the remnant because the Most High have already said only a remnant will make it. So don't try to do it. Don't try to uh, reach everybody because you're fighting against the most high. He's already said only a remnant will make it. So my conversation is directly to the remnant. Just to you out there. Because with us, with us, we'll set things back in order. First, through the black man. Do you understand? I so value you when I see us acting according to what we've been indoctrinated and, and socialize into, I see, oh my God, what a, waste of white, what a waste of black skin. When I see, listen to me, when I see us as a people, black men, operating contrary to his dominion, I say to myself, what a waste of black skin. Because I know who we're supposed to be and who we are. Right? I know it. And so my expectation of you is so high. I don't have a small expectation. I remember my little partner C-Note one time. And this is when uh, I, I, I got out the game. And, um, you know, I was talking to people about doing a documentary. And um, uh, I was talking to these Hollywood uh, producers. This is a true story. And, um, you know, uh, and after we had talk, finished talking business, this is many years ago. Um, they were asking me, you know, do you know anybody in Vegas? Because we're about to go to Vegas, me and my friends, and we want to have a good time, and we just don't want to have no, no bad energy. You know, they're looking for some girls or something. So I told him, I said, you know, I'm not in that lifestyle anymore, but I still have relationships with people that are still in that lifestyle. I tell you what, I can give them a call and see if I could, you know, hook something up for you, right? And I said, listen, when the girls come, uh, they'll probably just give you a massage or dance for you or whatever. Anything after that, that's on you guys. But I'm just telling you from the gate, I'm not saying this is no sex or nothing this is involved. I'm just letting you know it's going to take $1,000 to get them to get them to uh, wherever you guys want them to come to. Right? So they agreed. So uh, uh, so I called my, my uh, partner and a couple other people, but I'm talking about my little young partner, C-Note. Right? 
And uh, I remember when Ceno first started in the game, he was around 17, you know, uh, you know, and me and his brother JD was real cool. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we was all looking out for Ceno because, you know, he was 17 trying to hustle and have a couple little bras and everything, you know. But uh, so this is later on. So I called Note and I said, look, man, uh, you know, these, these Hollywood producers are coming and, you know, they want to see a girl and all that. And I called a couple other people. I said, look, it's a thousand dollars just for the girl to go there for a dance or a massage. I said, but anything beyond that is on y'all. You'll got to make those agreements yourself. I'm not involved in that. And I said, tell you what, I hooked it up, you know, and I, w I just got out the joint not long after that. I said, just give me two hundred dollars for the hookup. So I asked each of them for two hundred dollars just for the hookup. So all of them sent me the two hundred dollars after the event happened. But C note, he didn't do it right right on time, right? So I called Note and I said, look, man, uh, what's happening? So he told me this excuse, whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever. Not to say that Sino has, <coughs> hadn't done other things for me when I got out the joint, but this was a particular separate situation. And I'm not saying that to disparage him. I'm just trying to tell you when you're trying to be an example to somebody, you got to make sure they show up in their greatness and you got to make sure you expect that out of them, right? Because it makes them a better person because that's how my father was to me. He wouldn't let me show up in my smallness. He expected me to show up in my greatness, right? So uh, it wasn't about the money. So it took a while, you know, like a week or so. So I called him one more time and I said, look, man, I said, I don't care how you show up to anybody else out there. But anything underneath greatness, I don't know you like that. I don't even know that person. When you show up to me, you show up in the greatness that you are. Because that's the only way I know you. I can, I can only identify with you in that greatness. Right? And I said, until you show up in that greatness, I don't want to even have nothing to do with you. I said, this, ain't, this has nothing to do with that little money. But it has to do with principle and character. Right? And I had to make sure that I maintain still being a man in my relationship with him because I love him. Right? I love him to this day. I might not have to agree with everything that anybody out there is doing or agree with everything, and he might agree everything with me, but I can tell you that I love him to this day, right? So I told him, uh, until you show up the way that I know you to show up and be a man of your word about anything in your dealings with me, then me and you are not going to talk. So I didn't talk to him until he showed up in his greatness. And he did ultimately show up in his greatness. So what I'm saying to you is that I have expect high expectations uh, of you as a black man and many of you have been showing up in your pettiness for so long that you think that that is your natural way of thinking right you've adopted pettiness into your character right and so you always looking for an opportunity to get over on somebody and be petty to somebody because you think that's the way to win right and so you showing up like that and you planting those seeds of pettiness and then you create a harvest of pettiness all around you. You attract petty people all around you. So you never can be really, really at peace. Because you know how you are and who you are inside. So you're already thinking that everybody else is like you too. Right? So you are never in no peace. You don't have no, no real sense of peace or peace of mind. Because of how you're showing up in your life. But you've adopted this idea that you're just that small as a black man. Right? Because this culture has taught you that you are nothing that you are a criminal. And so you celebrate criminality. And criminal is subjective, or criminality is subjective because they can make a law about anything. I'm just saying on the most part. You showing up underneath who they say you are, so because you believe that lie, you show up in that. And that's who you become, right? But I'm telling you, reason why God said it's only a remnant because when I come to you like I came to see, no, like my father came to me, um, uh, two-thirds of you, two-thirds of you are going to reject this good doctrine. Two-thirds of you are going to reject being still a man. You're going to choose to be petty. You're going to choose to allow the ways of the oppressor to continue to create your harvest around you. Right? And you are in, and just like a dog, Throwing up and eating his own throw up. That's what you do. So. So what I'm saying to you is that because I have such an expectation of you as a black man. You can't show up to me any kind of way. I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't see you as a black man. Right. You are an alien. 
to the greatness of what a black man is always supposed to be. I don't know you. Show up in your greatness. And then I will recognize you. Oh, that's a black man. <laughs> What's up, bro? But all that other stuff, I don't even recognize you. I don't even know you. And that's why the Most High said, many will come in my name and come in the last day said, I did this in your name, I did this. And the Most High is going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, you petty individual. I never knew you. I never knew you. When that word come to free you, you better grab hold tight of this word more than anything in your life to get your freedom back. Or forever be cursed in that indoctrination of pettiness. Show up in your life, great black man. I'm tired of people using you as some example of what pettiness and small and criminal is. You're none of that. You're great. You're dignified. You're mighty. Look at what they brought us, took us through. Look at all we had to face and we still standing today. That says something about who we are. That says something about who we are as a people. The cream must rise to the top and it's time for that remnant to rise to the top. Is it going to be you? Or when this word come, you reject it. Because remember, two thirds of you will. I'm not uh, offended when people don't want to hear me. Because I already know two thirds ain't going to make it. That's why I stay focused on the remnant. From the first time I start doing these daily fires, I've always made it clear I'm not here for everybody. I'm here for that remnant. And those are the ones that would hear this word and apply it and remember who they are. This is nothing new that I talk about. We've been this before. Do you hear what I'm saying? We've been this before. And I need you to remember who you are and reject all that who you not. Because all you've been being educated on is who you not for these 400 years in this country. But you've never been that. Now it's time for the veil to be open. For you to really look at yourself and say, my God, I'm a black man. That means we are the first man, the first rulers of this world. And it's time for us black men to take that position back by our example. Right? We got to get us right first. So. Let me go back to what I'm saying to some of them other organizations that don't like the way that I operate because they think it's respectability politics. And I'm trying to explain to them, listen, I lead. I don't follow these people. For what? I, the only people, or person I follow is the most high. And the information he's going to give me is glimpses of the future that they can't even stop because they don't know. Because they don't know. This is spiritually uh, divine and inclined. This is not no natural stuff going here. This ain't no natural knowledge that I have. I didn't go to Harvard or Yale or Oxford or Cambridge. The Holy Ghost gave this to me. The Spirit of God, the most powerful entity in all existence that created everything. And it doesn't really matter if you don't believe that. But how can you explain the evidence of the work that I'm doing? And I continue to tell you that it's the most high in charge and he's given me the message to give to you. And he's not giving me the message to give to you without any evidence because he knows us. He says, wait a minute, my people have been so distraught, lied to. Now, when I send these messengers, I'm just one. There's probably many out there all over the world that are us, right? When I send them, I will send them with the evidence. Apostle Paul said, I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration, in demonstration of the spirit of power. Right? In demonstration. So as I'm talking to you, you see demonstrations of the information. That's how you know. That's how you know. 
You will know them by the fruits they bear. What fruit is people bearing that's speaking to you? How else can we define the righteous from the unrighteous? Right? The visionary from the deceiver. What are the works? Does the works line up to the words? That is our job as a remnant to make sure that the work, the evidence, the demonstration lines up with the words. If the demonstration, the work, does not line up with the word, that's problematic. We need to shut that down. No more is it acceptable for us, the remnant, to have somebody speaking stuff without proving what they're saying. Present the work. Present the evidence. That's where we are. That's the stage that we're at as a people. Do you understand? Present. As I'm teaching you how to be aware. First, to be accountable for who you are. A lot of you did not know who you were. We've been doing these daily fires for a long time. You've read it. You, you've assessed them. You've, you've, um, you've assessed them. You know, uh, you've listened over and over again. And you begin to grow based upon the fundamentals and those seeds being planted inside of you. To, to make you defiant and indignant against anything that makes you petty. Because you know, a petty move makes you less than who you say you are. Again, we're not doing this for white people. I've done a video before, and I told you guys before, when, I, when I, Dove and I met, and I told Dove, I said, I don't, I'm not this for you. Good that you could benefit from it, but I'm not this for you. You're not that powerful. I'm not this for white people. So when that black organization was saying, you play in respectability politics, I'm looking at them like, I'm not this for them. This is who I am, period. You're not changing my character. My dad said, never let them become your teachers. Then people don't change my character. That's what they want to do. They want to change your character. They want to keep you from remembering who you are. And I'm reminding you because God sent me to say so. But he didn't send me without any evidence. Okay? Don't, he didn't send me without any evidence. Understand what I'm saying. It's evidence-based, which is why people are so fearful of it, especially systems. Because they don't mind people just out there talking. There's people out there talking all the time. Conscious, woke, uh, everything. You got uh, many of us out there talking, women and men alike. Right? I mean talking good stuff. Talking. But what have they produced for the community? I often say that after we finish here in Washington State with this setting this precedent for what police accountability looks like, how to bring government uh, community, law enforcement, how to bring that together with black genius. I said that I will go around the country and help our brothers and sisters in different cities and states. Remember I said that? But I have no business going around nowhere unless I could produce in my own city what I'm trying to make you believe in yours. What the hell does that look like? What the hell does that look like? I'm going to come to your city and state and then tell you something and you can come look at my city and say, what have you done in your own city and state to be coming to talk to me about how to get things changed? If you don't miss me with that stuff, do you understand what I'm saying? Which is why I needed to complete things here so that I can present evidence, the blueprint. You know what I'm saying? And having done something here first before I try to go win you over somewhere. Because that's what happens. People go all over the country talking about resolutions. Monty, thank you for that 10. All over. People just be talking everywhere. Oh, we're going to go over where and share this with everybody else and everywhere. But what have you accomplished? What have you done? First, please, if you're going to go speak to our people, I'm going to make sure the remit has higher expectations of the people that's speaking to them. Present the evidence first that we don't want to hear from you. Period. Period. You remember the old day? Well, you might not remember the old day, but there's a saying that uh, 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 in Africa before, in some tribes, that before a man, uh, before a, a, a boy can become a man, he has to go out there and slay the lion or slay the wolf. You know, slay the lion by itself. 
or he don't be no man, right? So he had to go out there and present the evidence that he's qualified to hold the office of a man. But there has to be some work that's done first. Do you understand? Work. So right now, we need to, you know, fix our minds to what we're going to expect out of the people that's trying to speak into our lives. Right now, we want work. Uh, the Christian church has been difficult for us in a lot of capacities because a lot of Christian leadership have fallen and failed over many decades. Uh, mess with people's wives, that's a, co a common thing. And it's denigrated the authority of that office because nobody can trust it. Because it's too much of it going on without any accountability. Right? It's kind of like law, it's kind of like police. Nobody trusts the police because when all these killings happen all over the country, there's no accountability. Nobody is holding police accountable for shooting black males, unarmed black males, no kind of black male. So there's no trust in the institution. Well, that's what happens with church leadership. If all this sexual immorality is going on all over the country and all over the world in the church without no accountability, then it loses its value. And nobody trusts it. But the church itself has to begin to address that situation. In the black church, that. In the white church, messing with people's children. Pedophiles in, in the white church. But there's no consequence. You can't never be no man if you live without consequence. Never. A man must understand that there's a consequence to his actions. Must. Because I understand that there's a consequence to minds before the Most High. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the church community is not effective in churching or believable because they refuse to address this elephant in the room. The white church, the Catholic church's pedophilia problem. They refuse to address that elephant in the room. Law enforcement all over the country killing black men without any accountability. No trust in the institution of law enforcement. Accountability brings trust back. Accountability brings trust back. You must be accountable for your actions. Especially you as a black man. Which is why I'm going back to this pettiness that I see in us. This looking for an opportunity to get over on your brother. That pettiness. That small thinking. That every day. You know what the scripture says in Genesis 6? That every imagination. That e Let me see. Uh, don't worry about them little people. They, that's, that's fear. That's fear. You know, I don't care nothing about them, them folks. You know, you've had your season and you see that it's about up just based upon the brilliance uh, that we're bringing before you. You know, and we didn't use your institutions to get it. That should make you be very, very afraid that there's a power in this earth that gives knowledge that makes yours look stupid. The scripture said the wisdom of man is foolishness unto the most high. So I understand why those folks are very, very insecure. You should be. You should be. Yeah, because there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> you feel me? Yeah. So, again, we must be held accountable. You have to be. You must hold yourself accountable. Right? Because it's innate in your character right now that you just first want to see how you can get over it. Right? Against somebody that looks like you, especially. You know what I'm saying? So it's, you don't even start off with a righteous mind or righteous thinking because you don't see any profit in righteous thinking. You don't see any profit. Because the profit you're looking for is financial gain. Because you don't realize the value of what manhood is and what manhood is gives you the capacity to do. You don't realize that. 
Once you do, you will look back at that little fella that used to operate like that, and you won't even believe it. You, you just won't even believe, you know what I'm saying? Because that was only your reference point. That's all you knew. All right? And I'm speaking to the remnant. I just want to remind everybody, because I know a lot of people are opposed to what I'm saying. Right? Them two-thirds ain't going to make it. But I'm speaking to the remnant out there. All right? And I don't want you to be distracted. Um, one of the greatest powers of white supremacy is its ability to uncover what you're trying to hide. So they have technology that could see through your walls and hear everything you're saying. And movements, black movements before, prided themselves on the ability to keep things quiet. Hush, hush amongst them. But white supremacy saw how to infiltrate that by using those two-thirds that ain't going to make it to put them into those environments so they can come back and tell systems what was going on. So what is the Most High doing today? And I'm telling you this in person. The Most High said that this thing wasn't done in the corner. So what black movements before thought was powerful, today, the most powerful thing in our movement is our transparency. We're gonna tell you what's gonna happen ahead of time. We're gonna tell you how we moving and tell you how we thinking. And because it's spiritual, Troy D, thank you for that 40. And because it's spiritual, you cannot profile the spirit of God. So you have the FBI putting a profile down on everybody putting a profile down on everybody and trying to profile us and our community, right? But you can't profile the Spirit of God, which is why we can be free to openly discuss what the Most High has talked about, what he's going to give us, what he's going to do. Just like we talk about those 400 years that's almost over at the end of this year. Yeah. So there's nothing you can do about what the Most High has already said. So I'm very free to talk openly you know, about what's going to happen, what's going on, and where we're at and who we are. There's no sense of me hiding anything, because this thing is not, was not done in the corner. Everybody will see. Everybody will see. Let me just go ahead and block this dude, because I don't know what's up with him. Uh, remove. All right. So just understand that. I don't want you to get into a space that you are fearful because of what is being said. Because remember, white supremacy has been an expert at being able to uncover what we are thinking about in our organizations by sending people in there that's more loyal to them because we don't know who they are. They might look like this, but we don't know them. We don't know who they are. You know what I'm saying? This is a new time. We're not hiding nothing. I'm still a man. I'm not going to hide nothing from you. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. It doesn't matter what you do because you can't prepare for the move, of, the move of the Spirit. You can't prepare for it. Everything is timing. The time you've had to have control over the world, you've had time. I'm not mad at anybody because it ain't me that has to pay for anything that was done. If you believe that whatever, so, whatever, whether, whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If that is a spiritual fundamental principle, well, that's the way the world is. Right. So whatever has been done, uh, God and uh, the law, the spiritual law will take care of itself. I have to focus on getting my people ready to govern. That's my focus. Get my people ready to govern. Get the black man in his right state of mind. Feed him the information that's, that's rightfully his. Make him throw up all the things that was taught him that he was indoctrinated into. I don't have to spend no time hating white people. Are you serious? For what? I'm so in love with my people, I don't got the time to worry about anybody else right now. I got to get us together. There's so much work getting us together, I don't even have the time or the luxury to be hating anybody. Can't nobody make me like them. God has called me into leadership as a black man to reestablish the position in the earth that we are as a people. And no matter how grave it looks, no matter how much you doubt it, no matter how much you don't believe it, with your very eyes, you're going to see it. I promise you that. Yes. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. I'm so confident because I've been through so much and I've seen God's word in my life continue to manifest and nothing stop it. 
You know what I'm saying about public, uh, uh, us being transparent about our movements? I was transparent about where, my, where I came from. Down to TV, thank you. I was transparent about me coming out the game. I was transparent about my parents being in the game. And they might have tried to use it to stop me from doing what I've done in social justice and politics, but did it work? Never one time was I concerned about them trying to use it because I was on a mandate from the Most High. Right? And it didn't work. But what God had given to me, it works. It worked in the game. It's going to work here. And it's going to work on this next phase, too. It's going to work on this next phase. What do I want to do next? What are we going to do next? Yes, we're working on bail reform and things like that. But the most important thing that's next is to come directly to my people. That's the next thing all over this country and have these conversations directly with you. To have meetings and this conversation directly with you. Somebody say, are you a preacher? No, I don't have a ministry. I have an operation. I don't have a ministry. I have an operation. This is an operation, right? It's like militant. Not militant in the sense of we picking up weapons or no, no. But the mindset. This is an operation, something to complete. Like what we did with Seattle, with police accountability, was an operation. Now it's time for the next operation. You know, when I went through the game, that was an operation. Get what you need to get. Get the information. Get the game. Get the knowledge so you can utilize it for the next level. Came through here. It's an operation. You know, Operation Seattle. Operation Game. You know what I'm saying? This is an operation. So the next operation is specifically us. And I'm more excited about that than anything ever in my life. Specifically us. I want to go around this country. I want to know you. I want to see you. And I want to organize you. I want to know you. I want to see you. And I want to organize you. There is nothing more precious than you, black people. Nothing in my eyes more precious than you. And this, I want to dedicate the majority of my time to us. Feeding us, loving us, getting us back into fellowship with one another. Bringing us back to a place of statue, character, greatness. That's what's important now. Us. That's the next operation. That's the next operation. So get ready. So, let me see what we're talking about today. Yeah, I don't need no good luck with that. Somebody said, good luck with that. I don't need no luck. It has been written. I don't go into anything with luck. I go into it with purpose. Because I know what I'm going to do before I get there. Uh, somebody want me to explain how, be more, how the black men and women are Israelites. I don't want to go into that conversation because it separates us. Muslims, Israelites, Christians, I'm not, I don't want to have that conversation. You know, uh, one thing I did say at my meeting last night is that when you are building a grassroots movement, a lot of us tend to think that you have to agree with somebody 100% of the time in order to be able to build with them. That's a mistake. That's crazy. I didn't agree with my father 100% of the time. Thanks, Jamal, for that five. I don't agree with my wife, my brothers, my sisters, my friends 100% of the time. But we still love and we, chill and we still build with each other. So I don't want to start off where, where there's disagreements at. Between, because uh, I've seen uh, a mean, a mean uh, with, with, with uh, uh, Martin Luther King and uh, uh, Malcolm X in a casket, and it was saying they didn't care whether they was Muslim or Christian. They, they only cared whether they were black. And so as we begin to start this new operation, we have to connect with the value of our blackness, the value of who we are in building our culture. And that's going to start with love, right? Love and forgiveness for each other, first off. You know, and that's what a man has to bring forth. He has to show what that looks like. I've said this before. 
I remember I was talking uh, to somebody else before and I was explaining to them. I says, you know, a king, the disposition of a king, and I've said this to you guys before, he is so powerful, not just because of his ability to rule and, uh, you know, and because he has subjects underneath him, right? But he has something special that an average person don't have, right? And that is his ability to pardon. A king has the ability to pardon. And so because I'm operating in my madness, because I'm still a man, a black man, a black king, I have the ability to pardon because of my position. A lot of you, it's hard for you to pardon or forgive because you're not in your right place as a king, which just makes it difficult for you. You know what I'm saying? You're still a pauper. You're still that petty person. And a petty person is not operating with the grace and the majesty of a king. He don't have that ability in him. He don't have it. You have to walk into the office of kingship in order for you to be able to pardon. I pardon you. And so when we two kings come together, and you begin to identify with who you are as a black man. And you identify my kingship with your kingship. And then that kinship. You see what I'm saying? That kinship. Then what happens is that we both have the ability to pardon one another. To pardon us for our misgivings. To pardon us for our past. And our ignorance. And our behavior towards one another. Calvin, thank you for that 20. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to be able to pardon people. You have to be able to do that. So again, all my folks on here that uh, is watching all these people that's coming on, again, that's natural stuff. You know, we take care of it, but I don't want it to make you be distracted because this is about us. This is our time, you know, and they wish to try to get attention, but we can't give them no attention. You've had enough attention for 400 years, right? And at this particular time, it's just not that important to give you our attention. All right. Uh, well, I don't want it to be a lonely position. I need us all to be operating where our words are matching our work. Do you know what I'm saying? Have you ever had a great friend, uh, uh, Joe Blas? Trey, if you ever had anyone you considered a great friend turn away from you, if so, how did you handle and get over it mentally? Uh, sure. Sure. You know, I told you about the story about C-Note, and you know what I'm saying? Uh, every situation I go into, remember, I got to still be a man. So I got to continue to lead. And even though I understand that situations like that have a uh, potential of happening, it won't allow me or keep me from walking in my manhood. I, I, I can't even allow that to stop me from being who I say that I am. So sure, it's painful and it's hurtful. You know what I'm saying? But people can only be who they are. And I'm going to be who I am. So if an incident like that happens, you have to take that pain. We built to take it. All the things our ancestors untook, this stuff, they say nothing. Oh, boy, what's up, boy? Thank you for that 20. This is nothing all the things our ancestors done went through. This little itty-bitty stuff ain't nothing. You feel me? All right. Keith, keep lacing us with the game, Dre. Thank you, family. Aku, what do we need to read to learn the system and duplicate what you are doing? You need to, listen... The system is not like I read a whole bunch of system stuff. The information came through the information that I'm giving you. Where the portals of your mind are, are able to open up and you can be, be able to stand and receive before the Most High. The information I have didn't come from them or they'd be in power. The information I have came from the Most High. And these daily fires for months and months and months, if you go through them daily fires and understand the fundamentals of so many things that I've talked about, the same thing that happens for me will happen to you. The key is to get you into your rightful place of, of manship. 
right? So that you don't do anything to, vi to violate that power that wants to come through you, right? Which is why I always bring it back to the man because it is because you are out of position that you don't have any movement, right? That you can't elicit the power of the most high. I'm operating strictly from the power of the most high. DJJ, thank you for that 50, baby. Why do you think the most high allowed blacks not to know who or allow the enemy to hide our true... Because we were in rebellion. Because we were in rebellion. And it's no secret, if you read throughout biblical history, you can see every time we went into rebellion what happened. Remember I said earlier that every man has to have some accountability, right? That there's a consequence that goes along with your action. So if we are the original people of God, and then we be, got, get to serving other gods and doing things more wicked than the heathen people, you don't think there's a consequence behind that? Of course there is. Lars, thank you for that 10. Ace, thank you for that 20. Of course there's a consequence. Right? So I believe that after this last consequence... We'll look and have that as history. We will never, ever be in a space to be in disobedience to the Most High. All these daily fires is just to teach you the benefits of being in obedience and yieldedness before the Most High. The knowledge, the power, the dominion. All of these daily fires and the actions that go along with these words, the proof. All that is to show you what it means to be right back aligned. And why it's so important for us to get there. You ain't going to read this from no secular people, from system people. You get this through relationship. There's a lot of books out there, but let me explain something to you. What do you think came first? The books or the experience? A1, thank you for that 27. Did the knowledge come first through the books? Or did the experience come first? So that it could be written in books. The experience is more important. Exactly, Fred. So you guys are always looking for books. And I'm telling you, the experience comes first. Then the books come later. Because the books are only written from the experiences of people that had. You get an experience. It develops knowledge and information. You put it in a book for other people to learn. It could be about anything. It could be how you went out into the wilderness and learned about animals. It could be how you went into the water and learned about fish and stuff. It's always an experience first. Don't think it's the book because it's not. It's the experience first. So these daily fires is to encourage you to position yourself back into alignment with the Most High to have the experience and what he expects of you as a black man in particularly because we so are so far from who we are supposed to be. And it is offensive to people to see my behavior. It is offensive because they say, who do he think he are? Who do he think he is? My disposition, my mannerisms, my authority, my confidence. It is uncomfortable for people to see me like this. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to be. The scripture said when Samuel, the prophet Samuel, would come to a town, that the elders of the town would shake. That's you, black man. When you get into your rightful place in your position, and when you travel around your world, this world, people will know it. They will feel it. Because you will walk in dominion, and that dominion will, be, will leave a history of demonstration. I leave a history of demonstration so people know I'm not just talking. Even my own people don't like my disposition, a lot of us. They're uncomfortable with me being so comfortable with who I am, right? When a white man operates in his position, they applaud that because they think that that's what white men are supposed to do, empower but dare not a black man be in his rightful place because he thinks he's all that or he's too much into himself. You see that slave mentality? You see that slave mentality? 
You think the white man is supposed to be polished, full of authority, but you don't see yourself like that. Please. That's small to me. You've been advantaged off the backs of my people. Remember, anybody can do good when everything is going good. But can you do bad good? That's something different. You feel me? Yeah. Let's see what people are talking about. These mental chains are some, are, yes, they something serious. But I'm working to break them all off because we're going to be free today. And be weary of people that's always trying to tell you how much they know about religion. You know how many people call me or, or not call me, but uh, 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 message me on Facebook and Instagram and begin to try to tell me about you ain't wearing no frills, you know, because the Israelites want to wear frills because I said, listen, man, I don't want to get into any of that legalism. All the stuff that you're telling me, the only evidence that I can identify with any of you is what is the most high doing in your life to impact what you're fighting for? We pass all this talking. I'm, I'm past all that. And I want my people to be past all that. I'm not interested in, you know, the frills is something that they used to say that the Israelites used to wear. They used to have little frills, tassels on the bottom of their clothes to indicate that they was Israelites. And that's a formality, right? So I tell the brothers before, I said, look, man. I said, one time we had our own country. We knew all the customs. We wore all the proper things, knew all the right things to say, and still was in disobedience to God. Because you could have all that exterior thing in as a form of godliness and not be yielding inside to the Most High and God uh, will still be displeased, which happened to us. I'm not interested in what you're wearing outside, your garments outside. I'm interested in what you're wearing inside and how that looks on the outside. How are you treating your brother, first of all? Why are you trying to tell somebody to wear your fr some frills at the same time you treat your brother like he's the enemy? How are you showing up in your life and in your community? How are you changing things through the power of what you are telling people? Or are you only putting people in bondage? Don't tell me about no frills unless you explain to me a yielded life that you have before the Most High. The frills ain't going to have you be. The frills doesn't determine your life being yielded because we had all that one time. DJ, thank you, family. Can an honorable man have two different women make a great impact on them and still be on one accord with the Most High? Or am I just lustful and want both? Of course, an honorable man. All through the scriptures, you've had honorable men that have multiple wives. Even though this culture teaches differently. I understand. But I'm not opposed to... I can't discredit what the, what the scriptures have said. David and down the line. Abraham, the father. You know, I can't discredit what the... What, uh, 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 what, the, what the scriptures say God didn't think nothing about it again God is thinking about your submission you know the story of Hannah when the, 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 the mother of the great prophet Samuel the one I talked about when he would come to a town and the elders would shake well his mother Hannah was one of two wives and the man brought both of his wives to the temple to pray you know what I'm saying in this culture, it's not like that. I understand that. But biblically speaking, it was. You know what I'm saying? But it, it, it can't be about, you know, you just want to have sex with a woman. You know? There has to be an understanding of what that looks like. And I believe that that's the only antidote to our problem in America. Really. Because we have so many unwed single mothers that I think it's the responsibility of black men, once they know who they are, is to go make sure that those women are not single and them children don't have a father. We've created that situation and we have to do something about it. That ain't going to just fix itself. Our original culture could have handled that problem easy. Right? And then at the same time, it ain't about no sex because back then, if you took a wife and you had, if you had sex with a woman, that was your wife. And if you treated a woman wrong, then there was a consequence behind that. 
So that kind of eliminated you wanting to just go get some woman to have sex because if you want to have sex, that's going to be your wife. And you're going to take care of each and every one of them women equally unless it's going to be a great consequence from the community and from the culture. Right? So right now, nobody want to have no uh, accountability to what that looks like. They just think, okay, I want to go have another woman. I want to have some sex because it's cute, got a nice body. Oh, contraire, my friend. Not in this culture. In this culture, if you go have sex with that woman, that's going to be your wife and you're going to treat her fair. There's going to be a lot of pressure put on you. Right? That's the only way that could work. To nation bill. It's the only way that could work. Not just to be going to have wives, just to have sex and all that. That creates a different type of culture with no accountability. Men need accountability because they're going to run around like we're running around the day in our, in our, in our, without any accountability but a whole bunch of unwed mothers. That would stop. If I was ruling something, that would immediately stop. Yeah, you want to have sex? That's going to be your wife. And you're going to treat her right. If you don't, you're going to be held accountable swiftly, severely. That's the only thing that, the only way that it work. Yeah. I'm not into this idea that somebody, you know, uh, 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 disusery idea. I don't think the black woman is God. I know some folks believe the black woman is God, but I think that she is highly precious in the world and she should be treated that way. And a lot of her behavior is because of your lack of man. I don't blame the black woman. I blame the black men. A lot of black men don't like that. God didn't go to eat him. Uh, God, when that situation happened, didn't go to Eve. God understood the headship that Adam had over Eve. God went to Adam and said, what the hell is going on? Well, if God went to Adam, he's looking at you in your head, your headship. You are responsible for the women underneath you. And if our women are in any situation that is unpleasing to you, it's because you got lack of man in you. Because I don't have a woman, even in the game. You know what I'm saying? That was uh, uh, just any kind of person towards me. It's because I showed up first. I showed up and, and the, the, uh, 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 the dignity of my manhood was so appealing to her that she showed up like she was supposed to show up as a woman. But you don't got no dignity in your manhood. You elevate sex and everything above your manhood. Your manhood means nothing for you. You's a baby. You ain't no man. You're in your feelings all the time. You're getting mad all the time. You know what I'm saying? Any little thing happen, you show up like the broad show up. I talked to you guys about this last time. That ain't nothing impressive. That ain't nothing impressive. You always in your feelings. You always hurt. You always sad. That's a choice. Now, that's a choice. You can choose to be that or choose to do something about your condition. Man, come on, man. You know, I've been in the gutter before. Worked myself up out the gutter. Uh, let me tell you this story. My dad uh, was telling me one time, I miss my dad, man. I wish you guys could have met him, man. And you would have loved him like I love him. But he was telling me that uh, uh, he was walking and he seen this, this, this homeless guy. Or he, the, he, he said he was homeless. And uh, he said uh, the homeless guy asked him for some money. My dad said, look, man, uh, I'm going to tell you like he said it, okay? So excuse my language. <laughs> so the homeless man asked him for some money. He said, man, look, man, uh, man, you need to go commit a crime or something. Man, I commit crime for this money I got. I, you know, if you commit a crime, you get caught, you got three meals in a cot. You know what I'm saying? Man, go, go commit you a crime or something. I'm committing crime for this money. <laughs> I said, dad, that's what you told him? He said, yeah, I wouldn't play. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, my dad was funny, man. Uh, he, said, he said, man, go commit you a crime or something. Man, I'll commit crime for this money I got, man. <laughs> oh, my God. My dad is funny for real, man. <laughs> you're going to get you three meals in the cot if you get caught, man. You're going to be all right. <laughs> oh, man. Pour my pops or something else, man. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, he was telling the truth, Helena. I'm glad, I hope you're feeling better, Helena. I know you was feeling kind of, 
you went to the uh, doctors. I hope you're feeling better, baby. Yeah, man, my dad is something else. Uh, the name of my dad's book is called The Mint Man. You know, he got four out of five stars uh, from the New York Times. Real powerful book, man. Uh, man is masculine energy. Female is feminine energy. Good is everything you can't add or take away. God is energy. Everything vibrates. All right, all right, Lavish Now I get you. Yeah, the mid man, that's it. Yeah, uh, we don't have a lot of fathers, but when we get to getting this remnant right together, okay, glad you're here, Prizzy. Thank you. It's sinful sent you. Great. Thank you. Uh, when we get to pulling this manhood back together, whatever issues we have had, they look unsurmountable now. But in the presence of this manhood that I'm talking about, it's nothing. Brothers, be encouraged. Operate and step into your manhood. And whatever issues we've had, even though it's lasted 400 years to develop all these issues, this manhood stuff that I'm talking about will fix that stuff no problem. I mean absolutely no problem. Absolutely no problem. You understand? So we get to operating and get our culture back together and get these men to understand the value of their manhood. Keep them from being petty. Have accountability around us to hold each other accountable, right? And that brings not only pressure, but support. You know what I'm saying? So we, we will be able to fix whatever those issues are. It's nothing. It's nothing. But we got to get the work on us on the inside first. You know, that's what it's about right now. Getting us together on the inside, right? Can you imagine just, just say 10,000 men that operate with the mentality that the Most High has given me that he wants you to have. Just 10,000 of us. 10,000 of us operating like this. I'm not joking with you will take the world, bruh. That's why I keep telling you it's only a remnant. It don't take all them people. Let them people be lost. It's you that the Most High is calling to. Just 10,000 men. That don't even, that's not even counting the women that are underneath you, that are trained like you, like, like a Dove is trained in her leadership and her power and the children underneath the family, in structuring our families together, just 10,000 of us will take the world. That's it. That's what I'm working on. Even 5,000. Come on now. That's what we're working on. That's why I need to come around the country. We need to have these conversations. You know what I'm saying? Do a couple theaters. And fill them up with us. You know? So we can have these conversations together. For this remnant. That's what I'm working on. All right. What we got here, y'all? I testify all of the physicists fire working with application. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. What spring water do you drink, Andre? Um, what did I drink? Oh, I bring I drink Crystal Geyser spring water. Mr. Pimpson, Shalom family. Eric says, I'm doing the work, bro. I'm going to try to keep my other brothers out here from being petty. You keep them from being petty by you showing by you showing them what a man look like. That's what you do. That's how you do it, family. Yes, T. Tony Davis, yes, sir. You know what? I'm going to do it. Tony says, Dre, we need you to lay down a doctrine of manhood and dominion. I'm going to write that book. And that, yeah, we need to put that together. You're absolutely right. Be blessed, King. Uh, what advice do you have for black parents who don't want to teach their kids about correct gender roles? Woo! That's a good one. Who to correct gender roles? Okay. I'm glad you said something about that. 
uh, not this Wednesday, but last Wednesday. Now, remember, my organization, I allow everybody to come, right? White, black, uh, uh, transgender, whatever. You can come and be a part of the social justice movement. So there was uh, two black women, that older black women. One used to be a teacher. And she brought in some paperwork saying that they were going to start teaching about, um, what was it, honey? Yeah, black transgenders for um, for a black history. And she was concerned, asked if she could talk about it. I said, of course, we allow people to talk about everything here. So um, her concern was she felt like the school should first tell the parents what's going on before they start teaching the kids. So... Uh, there is, like I said, everybody come to our meeting and there was a person there who was kind of offended because he was transgender and he began to speak and he got real emotional and, you know, I'm sure he's gone through a lot of things in his life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, going, you know, judgment and all the things. And he's a teacher too. He teaches like elementary or something. So it became a big issue. So what I told him was this, look, man, um, this is how I fall in this issue. I don't believe that religious folks has a right to keep you from doing what you want to do. And then I don't believe you have a right to keep religious people from doing what they want to do. I'm going to fall in the middle, right? Fair is fair. It is a touchy subject. Sunny is a touchy subject. But I'm going to fall under fairness, right? The moment you begin to try to make some to take some liberties away from either one, I'm going to have a problem with that. Because he said, well, if they don't want their kids to be taught about transgender, something that's real and going on, then they should make their children go home and be homeschooled. I said, I got a problem with that. Because now you're a decider, you know what I'm saying? Because don't, people don't believe the way you want to believe that they don't have, that they don't, that you don't want them to be a part of, of the school now. I said, that's a problem. You know, I said, now, I don't believe they have the right to keep you from doing what you want to do. Right. And so Dove said something about, you know, we know, you know, whatever lifestyle you're in. And they took he took that very offensive because he said it's it's not a lifestyle. It's what we were born in. So to that community, saying something is a lifestyle is offensive. She didn't know. I didn't know. So he got real upset. So I told him, I said, listen, I said, there's some cultural differences here and we can have this conversation. But like I said from the beginning, everybody doesn't have to agree on everything to be able to build together. Right. So I said, there are some black people here that that are spiritually and religiously inclined that believe a certain way in their life. And they could have that. They ain't got to dislike you or nothing, but they believe that way. And I said, and you are here, and you believe a certain way in your life, right? I said, but if you don't communicate and educate us about what to say or what's offensive, instead of being offended by thinking that we should know this, then that's going to be a problem. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. It might be that, probate mind and all that, but I got to work through it all. I'm leading today. There ain't no issue that I'm scared of. I'm going to lead today. You know what I'm saying? So I'm a, I tackled the situation. But I'm trying to explain to him, if you're not capable of expressing to an audience that's willing to learn, right, then we need to bring somebody that can come bring the conversation so that we can understand. Because I do want to understand. Because if somebody get killed that's a transgender and they call my uh, uh, killed from police that's a transgender and they call my organization... I'm going to help them like we've helped white people, like we've helped Samoans, like we've helped Latinos, and of course our people, right? So if that happens, we want to make sure how we operate. Because I got into a situation one time with some Native families. Uh, a girl named Renee was killed as she was having a mental health crisis, and police came into her, her spot and killed her in front of her children, right? So what my, my organization, I thought we should do, I said, what we're going to do, we're going to throw a fundraiser for the children that's left behind and raise money for the kids. I thought it was a great idea. Fortunately, we had, look a little bit. You want to come over here? Come on. 
For, come on, sit down. Sit. Fortunately, we had uh, a, 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 a native that was a part of not this time that told me, you can't do that. I was like, why? We want to help the family. Yeah, the Davis family, exactly. And she was explaining to me that natives are not allowed to speak a relative name for a year and that it would be offensive to their culture. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so glad that you told me this because I had no reference points of that. So it's the same thing that I'm saying. You got to be educated and be willing to understand about people's culture if you're trying to help them. So it's the same with this transgender thing. I don't know everything about it, but I'm willing to learn because we might need to help somebody. But if you can't communicate to us, you know, and, and give us some education without being uh, uh, feeling that you're being attacked, then it's not going to work. I'm going to have to bring somebody in that could do that. Because it was a real, he got up and wanted to leave, leave and all that, but he came back uh, just Wednesday. You know what I'm saying? So this is how you deal, because I still got to be a man, right? So it doesn't matter. I don't have to agree with everybody out there about whatever they're doing in life. That's not my position, right? I'm very grateful that you're coming to be a part of social justice and working. You understand? But I still need to be educated on this because I might be offensive like I was, uh, like I was going to be to Renee Davis' uh, a family, thinking I was doing something good and then offending the whole culture. You feel me? So, uh, yeah. So it's good to get the information, you know. So, so when you are expressing to your children, because I agree with the teacher in that the school should let the parents know to give them uh, to give them the ability to say whether they feel that their children are ready to have that conversation. Just like sex, right? It, before you start teaching my children about sex, give me, the, give me uh, the ability to say, I don't think my child is mature enough at this age to start talking about that. I want to talk to them uh, when I feel that they're ready. I will communicate the, that information to my children. So I do believe that the school should at least give the parents an opportunity to decide whether they feel they want their kids to have that information at that time. So that's how I came down to it, and I hope that answers your question. Okay. What do you think uh, what do you think about sex offender laws? That's a touchy subject as well. But you know, I'm a man of God. And, and I believe in, uh, uh, when I say that, you know, I'm not saying it religiously. I'm talking about the fundamentals of what I live my life by, being fair, right? So the worst crime to me in the world is the rape of a, of a baby. I can't find anything that I feel is as harsh as raping a baby. And it goes on, and that's the worst thing in the world for me. You know what I'm saying? So what do I feel about it? I think rape is, is horrible. And anybody that has gone through rape is horrible. You know what I'm saying? Uh, do I feel like a person can be restored and redeemed? I have to. Moses was a murderer. Apostle Paul was a murderer. And the Most High restored them and put them in positions of leadership. So I have to believe. I have a friend of mine called Willard, uh, his name is Willard Jemison. And he was one of the youngest children to ever be convicted for murder. He was 13 years old when he went to the penitentiary. You know? And he's out like five, six years now doing some of the most awesome things you could ever imagine. I'm going to bring him on not this time because he is a heavy fella. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring him on. I mean, I'm going to bring him on Daily Fire. Willard Jimison. Real powerful, bro. You know, my little brother. I call him my little brother. Him and my brother Shea was cool up in the joint. You know, but I think Willard did about 20 years or 20-something years, if I can recall. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, he's been out. He works for the Urban League. He's managing over there. He's very influential. He's a credible messenger. You know what I'm saying? Helping young kids and just a real powerful brother. So I can't say that people cannot redeem their life. I had to look at my own life coming from the streets and my own background and my own environment 
and how my life has been, you know, uh, uh, changed in, in some kind of capacity. So I can't look at my people and say, and partial out what I feel somebody can re be redeemed from. I think they can be redeemed from rape. Of course, there's a, you have to pay your penalty. You have to pay your price. And whatever that price God has deemed for you to pay, you're going to have to pay it. You know, and after you paid your price, I feel like you should be free from that. I mean, I really feel that. If you've done 30 years for a rape, you should be free of that because you paid your penalty. And I hope that during them 30 years that you have not only uh, paid for, for that, but prepared yourself and become a new person and got whatever help you need because some people be having some mental issues. That's not an excuse because they still going to have to pay for their crime, but some people be having some mental issues. Some people have been abused and become abusers. You know what I'm saying? So it really all depends on the situation, but I still believe in redemption for all people. What else we got? I'm gonna answer a few more questions, family. Y'all go ahead and push that like button if you haven't. You miss you miss an hour and a half of it, King. You just got to go over it. Just look him up. Oh, found a book. Thank you guys. Okay. When the next not this time meeting happen? We happen every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. 6 to 8 at SVI, the Seattle Vocational Institute, every Wednesday, you know. If you make a white person feel insecure, how do you get them to support and work with you? Or do you need good-hearted white people to make this work? No, no, no. I, I, uh, I, I don't, you know, when you say if you make white people insecure, um, I, if I make white people in I don't know if I make somebody insecure because of some truth, then that is a, char a character flaw on their part. You know, I haven't had that problem. I have white people that I really care for that is a part of Not This Time and have done great work for Not This Time. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I, I believe that a person that has racism has character flaws. If you're black, if you're white, if you're Mexican, whatever. If you have racism in you because of somebody's skin color, then you are character flawed. And ultimately, you are not to be trusted. You could be a billionaire, and I have to look at you as a character flawed individual because ultimately, you're going to make decisions based upon your bias. You understand what I'm saying? So, so um, I haven't had a problem because I welcome all people. I'm a black man, right? And and uh, so I never have to say that I have a black organization because I have an organization uh, that's uh, complete with all people. My organization actually looks like America because we help all people. And all people are a part. But what I want to do next, when I'm talking about coming and speaking to my people directly, is different from not this time. It will be different. You know what I'm saying? The next operation will be something uh, specific to us. You know, it'll be specific to us. And it won't be engaging white people like that, right? Not this time is for that. This is something very, very specific to our people, what I will be doing next. You know, I, I'm, build, I'm doing a lot of things at one time, but this next operation will be black people specific, you know. So I just want to let you know. And not this, not this time will still be in operation. Oh, no. Somebody keeps asking. I haven't been to Africa yet, but I'm going to go. Who is the dirtiest of the three, prostitutes, strippers, or common women? Well, I, I wouldn't lead off with that word, the dirtiest. You know, that's inflammatory for me. You know, um, everybody has a backstory. If somebody is decided to be a prostitute, that's a backstory behind there. A stripper, there's a backstory. Them is human beings. And I'm not... I can't lead off calling somebody dirty because of the profession they chose. They can lead off and say, I'm dirty. You know what I'm saying? So I wouldn't characterize anybody that's in any one of those professions as dirty. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, speak, speak. Yeah. We got to get on the breakfast club. You know, so my boy Maurice is trying to get me on there. I don't really, 
you know, I'm not looking, you know, again, this is for the remnant and everybody might not can appreciate the information as of yet. But, uh, you know, if that happens, it happens. I'm not, you know, that's not an aspiration of mine to get on the breakfast club. I don't, yeah, I used to have a pastor when I was about 16 years old. His name was Elder Green. And uh, he used to say this, and I kept this to my day. My boy Droney, man. There we go, 50. Good to see you, man. Good to see you, family. Thanks for your continued support. So my pastor at 16, he used to say something that I keep with me this day. And uh, uh, um, um, Elder Green, that's right. El Elder Green, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. So Elder Green used to say, uh, I don't work to be seen, but I like to be seen working. So I love that. You know, I love that. I love that. You know, I remember one time my little nephew was saying when I first started with Not This Time, he said, Dre, man, you could do this, 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 and this to get some media attention. I said, no, 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 no. The moment you start doing something to get media attention is the moment you've lost your focus and your first love of what you're doing and the reason why you're doing it. You do the work and that'll come with the territory. Never give that priority. Never, never give that stuff priority, right? Ever. Ask the next time after I donate some money, but what is the significance of Africa for African Americans in your struggle for any sort of liberation? But what, but what is the significance of Africa for African Americans. Well, I understand that there are dilemmas and have been between uh, Africans and African Americans, which are really the same people, you know. And right now, my focus really is to do the work that I do right now, to focus on myself. Because, um, you know, when you begin to focus on, on those exterior things without making sure that you are a complete man, then you go into every situation incomplete, incomplete in your thinking, incomplete in your motives, incomplete in your disposition. And so it's really important, you know, to get us right here, right now. You know, I have a love for all my people, the whole As uh, African diaspora all over this country, all over this world, excuse me. You know, but we are so in dire straits, and I know our people are there, there too, but we are so in dire straits that in order for us to uh, begin to join back, support, get support, help. We need to get ourselves right because we're so off track right now as a people in this particular country. So, uh, you know, that's my focus right now and ultimately to get to Africa with my people out there as well and to receive and to give whatever I can share and to receive what they can give to me as well. So uh, that is the plan. Yeah, it is our homeland. We were kidnapped, exactly. From there, we didn't immigrate, right? Right? That is very, very significant. I agree, Tony. Who was that? Oh, Troy. A couple more questions, you guys, and I'm going to shut him down. A couple more questions. On accountability, I read that being offended is proof. Offended is proof that the offended is lying. Does this make sense? Unpack that for me. I don't understand what you're saying. Unpack it for me. Brad Cooper, what's your thoughts on the 2020 presidential election? I have no thoughts about it as of now. I'm, I'm too focused on getting our people to ready, getting our people ready for this new transition that is going to be brought that people don't know that's coming. But because I know what my focus is trying to get my people, that remnant ready for that transition. That's where I'm at right now. Books you recommend other than Sid Arthur? Uh, I recommend Ogmandina, the greatest salesman in the world. Uh, I recommend Games People Played by Eric Byrne. Uh, I recommend... Uh, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. I recommend my dad's book, 
uh, The Mitten Man, my book, The Road to Paradise. Did I say Og Mandina, the greatest salesman in the world? Yeah, go, go take a look at those books. Dream about 2019, Red Star. Do you think it will happen in the book wrote? Uh, yeah, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know what I was told. And um, this is why it's so important for me to get our people together. It won't be the end of the world. Uh, there's going to be some devastations that happen, but it won't be the end of the world because I saw myself doing something in 2020 that will be the beginning of 2020 that will be, that will be very significant to what happened in 2019, you know? So, you know, I just seen some devastations and uh, I don't know how it's going to play out. Uh, I believe that when that devastation happens, I believe that there's not going to be any sun for about three months. I believe that there's going to be a lot of um, animals that go extinct. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about it based upon the dream that I had, but I know it's in the Bible as well, you know, but I know that, you know, the Most High said it would be 2019 at Christmas time. So he gave me those specifics, and so we're going to see what happens. So later on, he told me that, you know, there ain't going to be no sun for three months. Because I know if there's no sun for a year, all men will die. Yeah, I can't expound upon the dream now. You got to go get my book, The Road to Paradise. I talk about it there, the 2019 dream. I had it uh, in 1999. Uh, when I was in federal holding. So you guys got to go check that out over there. It'll tell you. What book, what book on spirituality, Dre, besides the Bible that resonated with you the most? Uh, the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Because I wasn't reading it like a religious person. You know, I was reading it from a whole different perspective. You know what I'm saying? So was, there were things that I was, be, I was able to get out of there. You know, just about some fundamental principles. I'll give you a perfect illustration, then I got to go. You know, uh, there are fundamental spiritual principles, spiritual laws that apply to anybody, whether you're black, white, rich, poor, a Christian, non-Christian, an Israelite, non-Israelite. I wanted to tap into those fundamental spiritual principles. For instance, it's a spiritual principle. If you give, you shall receive. It don't matter if you're white, black, rich, or poor, Muslim, Christian, uh, Buddhist, Israelite. If you give, you shall receive. That is a spiritual principle. So there are principles in the scriptures that apply just to anybody. And so I kind of focus on those spiritual principles that would apply in any circumstance, which is why I was able to utilize those things in the game. Because it didn't say if I was, quote unquote, good or bad, rich or poor. It just said this is a fundamental principle. And if you apply this, this will happen. It's bigger than you. It's a spiritual fundamental principle. So that's how I read the Bible. So when I'm reading, I'm seeing fundamental things in there that just apply. You know what I'm saying? A soft answer turns away wrath. That's a fundamental spiritual principle. So you begin to practice in that knowledge so that when you get in the confrontation because you done studied and you done read and you are aware of these fundamental spiritual principles, when somebody is yelling, where do you learn this from? Well, the scripture said a soft answer turns away wrath. So when they're yelling and they're in their child, and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, as Eric Burns says in Games People Play, everybody has an adult, a child, and a parent. And when people are operating in their child, you operate in your adult and your parent. And your parent. So when they're yelling, God damn it, oh, 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 all this stuff, then you simply say in your parent or your adult, I'm sorry that you feel that way. And you control the situation. So the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. So it's the same principle. And somebody doing all this, doing all this, yelling and all that, and I go into my into what I've been educated in. I say, you know what? You could be right about that. And maybe we could have handled that situation a little different with that tone. So now that's my whole mannerism because there are fundamental principles that I've adapted and applied to my life, which is why I keep telling you guys, you know, this is a spiritual thing going on here, you know? You get to reading that Ecclesiastes. You get to reading those, that proverb. You begin to read in the Apocrypha, the wisdom of Solomon. You read those fundamental principles about how reason is, is stronger than emotions and why you need to re, uh, utilize reason over emotion. And that's in the book, the wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha. Those are real powerful, fundamental spiritual principles that have you so powerful. And that's knowledge given to us as a people. 
That's what we gave to the world. You know what I'm saying? To remember who you are. So, you know, that's how I got it. And then living that out and seeing the results of it solidified and cemented that character inside of me. That understand this works and I'm going to apply this no matter what. So listen, I love you guys. You're beautiful. You're powerful people. And guess what? It's your time. And at the end of the day, I'm going to be able to say, and I hope you're going to be able to say,